What's up, y'all? I do believe I am live on Facebook. So let me let my group know. Let me let my group know that I'm here. All right, the group knows I'm on. And uh, get my Insta going. So funny because Insta looks different depending on whether or not you use it on your phone or whether or not you're like on a laptop or desktop. Talking about no internet. I told you I always something funny. But we're gonna start on time. Live on Institute. What's up, Instagram? Okay. Okay. Things looking good, I believe. Okay, so it's two thirty. So we're gonna start. Take my gloves off. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, thanking you for yet one more time to come before you, God, to hear from you, to to get into the Logos Word, to hear the Rhema Word to hear what you have to offer, oh God, because we know that you are fresh every day. We know that you don't have any down Sundays. We know that you don't have any bad days, oh God. So we thank you, oh God. We thank you for what you're going to do. So God, I must decrease so you can increase. So I die to myself right now. Please wash me clean and fill me with the Holy Ghost so that all the words spoken are the words that you want spoken, spoken. Flow through me, oh God, that you might be glorified and that the demons might be terrified and that the saints might be edified and that sinners might be mortified to live without you for one more day because the Spirit of God has brought conviction and repentance into their life. I thank you for God. Signs and, signs and wonders and miracles shall follow this prophetic word. And God, we're believing you and expecting you to do great things. We thank you for and we believe you for and we give you the glory and we give you all the praise as you are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, amen and amen. Today's live prophetic word is the best products of the land. Today's live prophetic word is the best products of the land. Let me put that on the screen because that's the title. You say, what are you talking about, Prophet Taylor? I'm going to explain, just hang with me, okay? First, we have to start out with the scripture, and then I have to give you the back story. Okay, our scripture is Genesis 43, 11 and 12. Genesis 43, 11 and 12. Then their father Israel said to them, if it must be, then do this. Put some of the best products of the land in your bags and take them down to the man as a gift, a little balm and a little honey some spices and myrrh, some pistachio, nuts, and almonds. Take double the amount of silver with you, for you must return the silver that was put back into the mouths of your sacks. Perhaps it was a mistake. 
Okay, now that sounds very, very random. So I'm going to have to give you the backstory, and here it comes. Now, for those of you that are familiar with the story of Joseph and his father and his brothers, then you know this story. For those of you that are familiar with it, here's what happened. Long story short, Jacob is the grandson of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham uh, was the man that God made the covenant with that he would make him the father of many nations. Abraham had Isaac at 100 years old with his 90-year-old wife at the time, Sarah, okay? And then Isaac had twins, Esau and Jacob. And you've heard me talk before about how Esau was the one that sold his birthright, and so it went to Jacob. Jacob actually ended up having four wives. That wasn't his plan. He just wanted one wife when he went and he met Rachel, the daughter of Laban. Jacob kissed her and he cried. He was so in love with her almost instantly. And so he worked in Laban's house and Laban's camp for Rachel. But when the seven years was up for Rachel that he had to work for, they slipped Leah in the tent. So they ended up, which still blows my mind. That means Leah's face must have been covered and she didn't say anything. How did Jacob, you know, not know that wasn't Rachel? But anyway, so they slipped Leah in the tent and told Jacob, we forgot to tell you, you have to marry the oldest daughter first. So work for me seven more years and I'll give you Rachel too. So that's 14 years just to get the woman that he wanted. And then there was some additional time too. But also with uh, Leah and Rachel came their handmaids, Zilha and Bilpah. So Jacob left Laban's house slash camp with four women, four wives, but he only intended originally to just have one. Why is that relevant? Because Jacob only loved Rachel. Jacob did not love Leah. Jacob did not love Bilhah and Zilpah, and he made that clear every chance he got. But he had plenty of kids by him. He only had two kids by Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. And Joseph and Benjamin were his favorites. He did not care about the mother women and he did not care about the mother kids. And he made it clear to them every time he got a chance to make it clear, Jacob made it clear that he didn't care nothing about Bilhah or Zilpah or Leah, no they kids. That's why those children grew up so angry. So there's a lesson right there that you're supposed to have kids by people you're married to and people that you love. If you don't have kids by someone that you love, then you're going to treat them like you don't care not about them because you don't care about them. You don't care about the mama or the daddy. And Jacob had a pattern of favoritism. He got that pattern of favoritism from his parents. His father, Isaac, preferred Esau because Esau was a, an outdoorsman, a huntsman, Okay, and his mother, Rebecca, preferred Jacob. More of a quiet dude, more of a mama's boy, more of a stay at home, more of a homebody, more stuff like that. Okay, so there was a pattern of favoritism built into Jacob's life when he was growing up. And so when he got grown, he repeated that pattern of favoritism because, again, he only loved Rachel and Rachel's two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. So as Joseph grew up and Benjamin grew up, uh, Jacob gave Joseph uh, uh, the charge of keeping his flocks and tending his sheep and basically learning how to manage his father's business. And also as a reward and just because he loved him, Jacob gave Joseph a coat of many colors. Then Joseph had a vision of seeing himself high and exalted and lifted up and the rest of his family bowing down before him. So all up to this point, his brothers just hated him. They were sick of him. And the reason they hated him, hated him is because Jacob loved himself, because he loved a mama. So of course he loved them. And he made it clear to, to Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah and all the rest of them that he didn't care nothing about them boys. He just cared about Joseph and Benjamin. So they hated him and they wanted to get rid of him. They snatched their brother, Joseph, one day and took him out on the outskirts of town and threw him in a pit. 
they thought at first that they should just kill him and be done with it. And if they killed him and were done with it, then they were going to co come back and tell Jacob that a wild animal had taken Joseph's life, that a wild animal had come out of the woods and killed their brother. And they brought back his bloody coat of many colors. So what happened, they were going to go with that plan. And then they said, no, they thought better of it. No, we shouldn't kill him because then his blood will be on our heads. And then at that moment, they happened to see a caravan coming from Egypt with all kinds of spices and, and goodly items. And they said, all right, we won't kill him, but we'll sell him. Let's sell him into slavery. And Joseph is screaming and Joseph is begging them not to sell him. Joseph is doesn't want to be separated from a family. Would you want to be sold your, your junior or senior year of high school to a foreign land by your own siblings? That's what happened to Joseph. So they took Joseph and they went with the other part of their plan. They killed an animal, got an animal's blood, put the animal's blood on the coat of many colors and uh, brought that bloody coat back to Jacob and said, Joseph is dead, an animal killed him. And Jacob just went into bereavement and Jacob never fully recovered from the heartbreak of thinking that he had lost, lost Joseph. Do you know why? Because Rachel died in childbirth. Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. So what that means in no uncertain terms is that Jacob had lost the love of his life and Jacob thought he lost his oldest son by her. So all that Jacob had uh, left of his relationship with Rachel was Benjamin. Because remember, he didn't care nothing about the mother children. And he made that clear over the course of their lives over and over and over and over again. He didn't care nothing about them. He only cared about Joseph and Benjamin. So in the meantime, what happens, because I have to condense a lot. In the meantime, what happens is Joseph goes to Egypt and Joseph prospers. And then Joseph gets a false rape accusation and he gets arrested and he goes to prison and then he prospers in prison and then they forget about him in prison. And basically his life is up and down, up and down for the next 13 years. He's doing well and then he gets in trouble and then he's doing well again and then he gets in trouble or he gets forgotten. And it was a serious roller coaster by, by the time, you know, 13 more years had passed. At the end of 13 years, when Joseph turned 30 years old, Pharaoh had a dream. And Pharaoh saw seven sick cows and seven healthy cows. And he saw seven lean ears of corn and seven thick ears of corn. All of Pharaoh's uh, magicians and wisdom uh, speaking people and soothsayers can interpret the dream. So one of the dudes that was in prison with Joseph told Pharaoh, wait, wait, that's right. I was in prison with a dude that knows how to do dream interpretation. So Pharaoh sent for him and got Joseph and Joseph cleaned himself up after all that time in prison, because prison wasn't like the penitentiary. It was like a hole in the ground. It's not like prisons we have in America. He cleaned himself up and stood before Pharaoh and interpreted that dream. Pharaoh was so pleased with what Joseph had said, because Joseph told him how to get ready for the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine. Pharaoh was so pleased with that until Pharaoh made Joseph basically prime minister of Egypt or vice president or vice chancellor, however you want to say it, he was number two, let me put it that way. Pharaoh took Joseph from being a Hebrew prisoner to the number two position in the country because he was so pleased by Joseph's interpretation of the dream that God had given Pharaoh. So Joseph now looked like an Egyptian, meaning he was shaven because the Hebrews still had their long beards. But Joseph looked like an Egyptian. He had the headdress and he had a clean shaven face, okay? Let's flash forward uh, just uh, a little bit. And the, the after the seven years of plenty, the seven years of famine hit. So that puts Joseph post 37 years of age. So it got lifted up at 30. Then they had seven years of plenty, which makes him 37. And then somewhere after 37 years of age, then the famine hits the seven lean years. So the, the thick cows 
and the fat ears of corn, we're talking about plenty, and the lean cows and the lean ears of corn, we're talking about famine. That's what Joseph was able to interpret for Pharaoh. That makes Joseph, again, 37 plus years of age. That means his brothers, the ones who sold him out and mistreated him and hated him, had not seen him for over 20 years. They hadn't seen him for over 20 years. They hadn't seen him for over 20 years. They had not seen their brother for over 20 years. You with me? Okay. So what ends up happening is the famine got really, really bad. And they had gone down to Egypt one time before to try to get corn because Egypt was the only country in the region that had corn because of the wisdom of Joseph because of the prophetic dream interpretation of Joseph. This is why you hear me say every week, you need a prophetic in your life. It was Joseph's prophetic dream interpretation gift that got him lifted up. And it was Joseph's prophetic dream interpretation gift that God used to save the entire land of Egypt and to save all of the surrounding regions because nobody had any corn or grain or food except Egypt. So that very gift that they hated you for and that very gift that they persecuted you for and that very gift that they talked about you for and that very gift that they called you names for is going to be the very thing that not only gets you lifted up, but is going to cause you to save nations. Okay, just a principle to remember. So they went to jo they went to Egypt. They met Joseph, but didn't know it was him. Joseph recognized him instantly because, of course, he did. They did not recognize him because, remember, we're talking about 20 plus years. He was a teenage boy last time they saw him with looking like a Hebrew. And now he's a clean shaven Egyptian nobleman. And they didn't recognize that that was their brother. OK, so they wanted to buy some food, but Joseph recognized them. But he didn't tell them who he was. He wanted to test them to see where their hearts were. So he said, do you have any more family? And they said, yes, we have a father and a brother. And then Joseph said, where is that other brother? Because they brought everybody but Benjamin, because Jacob wouldn't let him bring Benjamin. And Joseph said, where's that other brother? And Jude was like, well, he's back at home and, you know, and he's our father's favorite child. And if something happens to Benjamin, our father is just going to die. Joseph said, go get him and bring him back here. Go get your little brother and bring him back. And Joseph said, you won't be allowed to get any food unless you bring that boy back here. Okay? So the, the story here in Genesis picks up on their second journey to Egypt. So I'm going to read you some of that. Okay? That was all to catch up. So Genesis 43 is the second journey to Egypt. Now, the famine was still severe in the land. We're talking about the seven years of famine that God had prophesied through that dream. So when they had eaten all the grain they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, go back and buy us a little more food. But Judah said to him, the man warned us solemnly, you will not see my face again unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother along with us, we will go down and buy food for you. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. Because the man said to us, you will not see my face again unless your brother is with you. So he cut him some slack the first time, but he said, no deal the second time if you don't bring Benjamin. Uh, Israel, that's Jacob, asked, why did you bring this trouble on me by telling the man you had another brother? They replied, I'm in Genesis 43. They replied, the man questioned us closely about ourselves and our family. Is your father still living? He asked us, do you have another brother? We simply answered his questions. How were we to know he would say, bring your brother down here? I'm gonna put where I'm reading from on the screen so y'all can see that. Verse eight, Genesis 43a, then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy along with me and we will go at once so that we and you and our children may live and not die. I myself will guarantee his safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, I will bear the blame before you all my life. 
as it is, if we had not delayed, we could have gone and returned twice. Verse 11. Then their father Israel said to them, if it must be, then do this. Put some of the best products of the land in your bags and take them down to the man as a gift. A little balm and a little honey, some spices and myrrh, some pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double the amount of silver with you, for you must return the silver that was put back into the mouths of your sacks. Perhaps it was a mistake. Take your brother also and go back to the man at once. And may God Almighty grant you mercy before the man so that he will let your other brother and Benjamin come back with you. As for me, if I am bereaved, I am bereaved. Verse 13, so the men took the gifts and doubled the amount of silver and Benjamin also. They hurried down to Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. Now, there is a lot of principles we need to glean from this. And I'm going to tell you what the Holy Ghost told me to say. Here come principle number one. First principle that you need to understand is that you might not recognize folks you haven't seen in a long time. Does that ever occur to you? Some of y'all looking at me right now, you got beef with somebody in your family. You got beef. You got long running beef. You got issues with somebody in your family that you've had for over 20 years. Principle number one is you might not recognize them now. How do you know? I'm typing that out. How do you know that that person that you left, that person that you hate, or that person that hated you? How do you know that they're in the same shape or the same state, the same anything as they were the last time you saw them? Let me say that one more time. How do you know that that auntie, that uncle, that brother, that cousin, that nephew, that father, that mother, that sister, that brother? Oh, there's Margo. Hey, Margo. On Instagram. How do you know that that person is in the same shape or state that they were in the last time you saw them? You're just assuming. You're just assuming there might be a blessing that God is trying to connect you with. And because of that long running beef and because of your last impression of them, the last time Joseph saw his brothers, he was 17 years old and they were selling him like a dog into slavery. This over 20 years later, remember? The last time they saw Joseph, they threw him in a pit and came up with a plan to get rid of him and was about to kill him and thought better of that and sold him like a dog and went on and lied to their father and broke their father's heart. They knew how much Jacob loved Joseph and they told him that lie anyway. How do you know that person you got beef with? How do you know that person you haven't talked to in 20 plus years? How do you know they're in the same spot they were before? How do you know? You're just assuming. Okay. Principle number one. Here comes principle number two. Principle number two is your stuff going to catch up. Let me write that down. Your stuff going to catch up. What do I mean by that? What do you mean by that, Prophet Taylor? I'll explain it to you. <clears throat> Here's what I mean. Scripture promises us is that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1 and 9. And then the Bible also says that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Biblical repentance means literally to change your mind specifically towards God. So in other words, you tell God, I realize you confess that what you did was wrong, but you also tell God, I realize that the way I was thinking was not right. And the way I was thinking was out of line with you. So God, now I want to think the thoughts you want me to think. Now I want to turn my life, uh, my thoughts in this area into what you want them to be instead of what I was doing. That's actually biblical repentance. And God calls us to both. God calls us to confess and to repent. Okay. If you confess your sins, God takes the blood of Jesus 
and wipes the sins, number one, off your account, so they're not held against you anymore by the court of heaven, and wipes your spirit with the blood of Jesus. So in other words, he cleanses you from that wrong, so you don't have to live in it anymore. So whatever it is that you were living in that you finally realized was wrong, God does not just wipe your account with the blood of Jesus. God wipes your person with the blood of Jesus and cleanses you. And that's why he told the woman called in adultery, go thy way and sin no more. Don't live that way anymore. And to not live that way anymore, you have to repent. You have to change your mind. You have to say, let's take adultery like the woman called in adultery. Uh, the Lord told her, go thy way and sin no more. So in other words, cheating on your husband or cheating with another woman's husband is not the way to live. So don't live this way anymore. Live differently. That's what it means to repent, to change your mind specifically towards God. That's the biblical meaning of repentance. Okay. But here's the part that both saints and sinners don't get. This part I'm going to tell you right here. If you don't confess and if you don't repent, your sins begin to pile up before God like a trash can. I know some people don't know that. I know some Christians don't know that. If you don't confess, so you're supposed to confess your sins to God every day. That's why the Lord says in the Lord's Prayer, uh, forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's what that means. That Father God, all the sins I have committed against you, please forgive me and then help me to forgive other people. So in other words, I'm not supposed to be holding on to my sins or theirs. I'm supposed to forgive myself and forgive them. And that's how God's going to forgive me. We've been praying that prayer since it was 10 years old. If you grew up in church, they taught you the Lord's Prayer when you were but a child, but you didn't know that you was telling God to forgive you the way you forgive other people. That includes yourself. See, so when you confess, God forgives you, but sometimes you're still holding it against yourself. When you confess, God forgives you, but sometimes you're still upset at that other person. See, that it's all a flow. You need to get forgiveness from God. You need to forgive yourself, and then you need to forgive others. That's the flow of forgiveness. OK, but if you don't confess, them sins pile up. And just like when you walk into your kitchen, if you haven't taken the trash out, it stinks. It stinks so bad. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Everybody been there. You're like, I'm going to get the trash. I'm going to get the trash. And then one day you walk in the kitchen and crack a pie out. <laughs> that smell hits you at the door. You come in from the outside. You're like, Lord. Because that garbage is piled up and now it's rotten. I stopped by to tell you, that is literally what happens before the throne of God when you don't confess and repent, when you continue in your sins as a Christian. They pile up before the Lord and they stink. And that's why our lives as Christians begin to stink when we don't confess and repent when we know something is wrong and we keep walking in the wrong, they just piling up. So let me tell you what, what that means on earth. <laughs> what that means on earth in your life is all that gonna catch up. It's different when you confess and repent. When you confess and repent, your slate is wiped clean, your spirit is wiped clean, and then now it's your job to take the word of God and renew your mind and say, I'm not gonna think the way I used to think. I wanna think the way God wants me to think. Now, of course, that's not going to be perfect. Of course, you're not going to do everything right. Of course, there are going to be mistakes, but at least you're on the path. At least you're on the path. Like, for example, if you struggle with money and then one day you realize that you haven't been tithing or giving offerings or doing alms for the poor, you haven't been doing anything with your money that the Lord told you to do. Then you confess that before God in prayer and say, God, I realize I have robbed you <laughs> in tithes and offerings. I'm sorry, I'm wrong. That's the confession. God wipes your slate clean. God wipes your spirit clean. That's the power of the blood of Jesus. And it never loses its power. And then God says, now repent. In other words, instead of what I was doing, I'm gonna take a dime out of every dollar off the top of my paycheck and put that in as tithes. And then it's up to you how much you get for an offering. There's not really a set amount for us now under the Old Testament it was because they ended up tithing about 33, 33 and a third percent, at least 30 to 33% is actually what the Hebrews tithe of their stuff. 
but it doesn't seem to be that same requirement in terms of a set number. Rather, Paul says that we can sow bountifully or sow sparingly, but God wants us to sow joyfully, but it doesn't seem to be a percentage beyond a 10%. So if I've been messing up with my money, I give God a dime off of every dollar off the top. And then I decide what I want to do for offering could be 2%, 5%, 10%. And then I give alms to the poor. In other words, I take of some of my substance and I'll be sure someone that has less than me has a meal or a pair of pants or some diapers for their child if they can't afford them. That's how we're supposed to use our money as Christians. So if you're not doing that, you need to confess and repent and get on that. If you don't confess and you don't repent and you don't align your life with the word of God, that stuff is going to pile up and on earth, it's going to catch up. And what that means is that you're going to come back around to a situation where you're going to have to face all that. Lord have mercy. See, that's why. The Bible tells us not to let the sun go down on our anger. God tells you, don't get yourself in the habit of being mad for a long time. Because what's going to happen is you're going to have to face that person again. How many people have been on, you've been with your parents on their deathbed and you had to face mom and them again? You got mad at your mother and stopped talking to her. And then she got ready to leave this world. You had to face her, didn't you? And then after she died, here come all these pent up emotions. Or your brother. You got mad at your brother and you stayed mad at him and then he died. And then you realize you never get a chance to make it right with him in this life. And then here come all these emotions. Or your father, you got mad at your father and kicked him out of your life. And then he got ready to die and then you had to face him again. Or he did die and it hit you like a ton of bricks after the funeral that I'll never get a chance to make things right with my dad in this life. Your stuff going to catch up. Don't nobody like that. I don't like it. <laughs> you don't like it. Nobody likes it. But that's what happens when you put your sin out there and you don't deal with it. As the scriptures say, your sin going to find you out. If you uh, cheated on your spouse and you got some side kids, them side kids going to catch up. If you as a woman went somewhere and slept with another man, got pregnant by another man, but you've been trying to pass that baby off as your husband's and you know good and well, them children or that child or somebody in there ain't your husband's. That's going to catch up. I'm telling you, just like when King David uh, slept with Bathsheba, got her pregnant, tried to get Uriah to sleep with her. Uriah wouldn't do it because he was more honorable than the king in that moment. So he had Uriah assassinated. And all the men that were in his company died because they were trying to get to Uriah. They had Uriah's funeral. He moved Bathsheba into the palace. Bathsheba had the baby and them two people was going to keep stepping like nothing happened. And God sent Nathan the prophet to tell David, no. And all these judgments came down on their life that the sword was never going to depart from David's house, that God was going to raise up trouble from his own house that David did it in secret and God was going to judge him in public in front of everybody. And all that happened. <laughs> Why? Because David and Bathsheba tried to act like they didn't do anything wrong. They tried to act like being over there tipping with each other was, hey, <laughs> not that big of a deal. And they conceived a baby. The baby died. And then one of David's sons raped his sister. And then Absalom, another son by another wife of David, staged a coup and tried to overthrow his father and kicked him off the throne. And David had to go on the run from his own kingdom because his son was trying to take over the kingdom, his son Absalom. And Absalom slept with all David's concubines in front of Israel. In other words, he shamed and disrespected his father. Is there any greater disrespect to your father than if you sleep with his girlfriend? That's what Absalom did to David. You know why? Because all that stuff that David and Bathsheba did, it caught up. It's going to catch up. I, see, I, see I, know, I know what happens when you stay angry too long. When you stay angry too long, your heart gets comfortable with it. It, it sits, it nestles, it grows. 
and you start to develop a root of bitterness in your life, and you start thinking that's just your personality, you start thinking that's just the way I am, you start thinking a whole bunch of stuff that isn't true. What's going to happen is before you leave this planet, you're going to have to face that, which is why God tells us to face it from the jump and don't let it sit and get comfortable in your life. If we won't confess and we won't repent, we won't agree with God that we were wrong and we won't change our ways, your stuff going to catch up. Okay? So in other words, in our story, them brothers had to face their brother again. And the first and the second time they faced him until he revealed himself later on in the story, they didn't even know that was Joseph. They lived with that guilt for the rest of their lives. It's all in the scripture. They lived, you know what it's like living your life, looking over your shoulder? You know why? Because you're waiting on your stuff to catch up. That's why. They did not recognize Joseph, but they did have to face him again. They thought they got rid of him. And then one day, all that caught up. Mm. Okay. Next principle. Here it comes. Next principle is you'll change with enough pressure. What do I mean when I say you'll change with enough pressure? I'll tell you exactly what I mean. you might be being stubborn right now. You might be angry right now. You might feel like your anger is justified. You might feel a whole bunch of things. But if enough pressure get on you, you'll change. In our story, what happened was they went down to Egypt the first time and Joseph sold them some grain, but Joseph said, you can't come back without Benjamin. So they ate up all the grain that they had, then they got hungry again. And Jacob was like, go back to Egypt, buy some food. And they was like, the man told us we can't come back without Benjamin. We won't see him. We can't buy anything if we don't bring Benjamin back. He told us that last time we was there. You understand that? So you might be, you might hate your father now. You might hate your mother now. What are you going to do if you get into a life-threatening situation and you need a kidney? And that woman that you hate, your mom, is the only match. What you going to do if you get in a life-changing situation and you need bone marrow, you need something that only someone that's a genetic match with you could provide. You know, I don't know what that might be besides a kidney, but because your body rejects tissues that it doesn't recognize. So what if your father, the very man that you hate, the man that you've hated for years, the man that you've cut out of your life, the man that you just won't forgive because of all what he did to you and you're never, you're going to hate him till you die. What if you get in a situation where that very man is the only man that can save your life because he's the only medical match for what you're going through? I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I'm just saying it can happen. It has happened. You'll change <laughs> with enough pressure. See, some people think they can beat the system because they have such a high uh, threshold of pain. They have such a high tolerance for pain. They think I can just take it. What are you going to do if your child gets sick? Lord have mercy. What are you going to do if, if when stuff strikes, it don't strike you? Strikes your child. What would you do if you had a terminally ill child and they died slowly and you had to watch them die over a period of months? What do you think that would do to you? Do you think you'd be willing to obey God then? Do you think you'd be willing to hear God then? You think you'd be willing to change your ways then? You'll change with enough pressure. And so in our story, it was the pressure of the famine, the seven years of famine the seven lean years that Joseph had prophesied was coming. They ran out of food. Let me tell you what happens when you run out of food. When you run out of food, all that food you said you hate, you'll eat it then. 
If you don't like vegetables and vegetables is all you've got, you'll find a way to cook them and put some salt and pepper in them till you like them. Because <laughs> you'll change. You'll change with enough pressure. With enough pressure, if you haven't worked for 18 months, if you haven't worked for a year and a half, them jobs that you said you despise, that you said you never do, <laughs> I bet you get them jobs going in. I bet you get your job on in because you're going to need a paycheck. You haven't worked in a year and a half. You'll change with enough pressure. And in our story, the famine got severe and they ran out of food. And Jacob was like, go back. Go back to Egypt. And they're like, we can't go back without Benjamin. He told us when we were there, don't come back without Benjamin. Okay. And I want to show you what Jacob said. Jacob said uh, in verse 11, through 14. Then their father Israel said to them, if it must be, then do this. Put some of the best products of the land in your bags and take them down to the man as a gift. A little balm and a little honey, some spices and myrrh, some pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double the amount of silver with you, for you must return the silver that was put back into the mouths of your sacks. Perhaps it was a mistake. What happened was that uh, Joseph put his silver divining cup in the backpack of his brothers unbeknownst to them. So uh, when they discovered it, they brought it back and Joseph accused them of stealing from him. So Jacob is saying, we need to deal with that. So we got to give twice the silver amount because you got to pay him back the silver that got in the mouth of your backpack. Maybe it was a mistake. Take your brother also and go back to the man at once and may God Almighty grant you mercy before the man so that he will let your other brother and Benjamin come back with you. As for me, if I am bereaved, I am bereaved. Look at that. Look at the change in Jacob when enough pressure got on and it was a matter of life and death and they needed some grub and they didn't have no grub. Jacob went from, you can't take Benjamin. Nope, no way. I'm not going to let you take Benjamin. Nope, Jacob went from that to, well, <laughs> if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. If I lose, if I lose this boy, then I lose him. You know why? You know why Jacob made that change? Because there was so much pressure on him because they didn't have no food. And if they opening all the cabinets, it ain't no food. And they're looking in the pantry and ain't no food. And they opened the refrigerator. Well, they didn't have a refrigerator, but I'm sure they had ice blocks. What no food. What no food. <laughs> they didn't have no food. They didn't have no food. They ate all the food they had, they didn't have no food. And the one but one place that had food, that was Egypt. So they had to go. So you'll change if enough pressure gets on you. It's just a shame that we have to wait to get to that point before we get right with what God is telling us to get right with. That's just a shame. But sometimes when we're stubborn and proud, we have to go through that. Sometimes when we're stubborn and proud, that's what happens. If we don't want to deal, if the Holy Spirit has put his finger on something in our lives and we don't want to deal with it and we get stubborn and proud and we tell God, we start telling God what we're not going to do and blah, 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 blah. Then I stop by to tell you, when enough pressure get on you, you'll change. It's a shame we have to wait to that point, but you will. Okay. Next principle because we've got to keep it moving. Next principle I want to give you is <clears throat> the best products of the land. Let's read those verses again. That's Genesis 43, 11 and 12. Then their father Israel said to them, if it must be, then do this. Put some of the best products of the land in your bags and take them down to the man as a gift. A little balm and a little honey, some spices and myrrh, some pistachio nuts and almonds. What did Jacob say? Some translations of balm, that word there in the Hebrew is sorry. Sometimes the balm was a wax resin. Sometimes it was perfume. Sometimes it was used for medicinal purposes. That's where we get balm and Gilead from. So there's many different words in the Hebrew. That word there is sorry. So uh, balm and a little honey, some spices and myrrh. Myrrh also could be used as perfume. Uh, some pistachio nuts and almonds. 
He said, put some of the best products in the land in your bags and take them down to the man as a gift. If you're the one who did wrong or even thinks that you did, send the best products. Good gifts have a way of soothing long running tension. So in other words, if you've been upset with somebody for a while and you kind of want to smooth things over, you kind of want to soothe the tension, don't send them like a coupon for some French fries. Don't send them like, like a coupon for a little $1 Sunday. Send them the best products. Send them the best gifts. Okay? Because the best products and the best gifts have a way of soothing tension. If you were the one that was done wrong, just wait. Just wait, because they're going to come back. At some point, they're going to come back. I told you two points ago that it's going to catch up. At some point, y'all are going to intersect again. But it's still a good idea to give them of your best. Because giving of your best has a way of soothing tension. And then in this story, this story had a surprise ending, and that is that the one that you thought was mad or the one you thought who did you wrong doesn't even want to retaliate. Joseph didn't even want to pay him back. He forgave him. And some of y'all are ashamed to come back and reconcile a relationship because you, you're, so, you're so convinced that the other person hates you so much that they're going to hate you forever. They don't want to talk to you. They're not going to forgive you or whatever. And you might get a surprise ending you might find that they're not mad at you at all, that they let it go a long time ago. You've been carrying it. But either way, when you bring some of the best products of the land, that can go a long way with smoothing over what's going on. Now, here comes point number four. Holy Ghost told me to tell y'all, uh, in reference to point number three, but this is point number four, that some of us are too used to cheap stuff. Some of us are too, oh, wait a minute. Did I, I didn't do best products of the land, did I? Okay, I should have put that on the screen. Best products of the land. Okay, now I'm on number five, and that is some of us are too used to cheap stuff. What does that mean? That means some of us have such low expectations for life and for God that God is trying to give us expensive stuff. God is trying to give us fresh oil. Trying to, God is trying to give us things that are level at levels higher than we're used to. And we're so used to thinking, thinking cheaply, thinking in terms of cheap stuff until we can't receive what God is trying to give you. And remember, the Lord told us how it works. How it works is, according to your faith, so it is unto you. A lot of the people that have wealth, do you know why they have wealth? They have wealth because they expected wealth. Uh, we're still in the middle of the Olympics. Do you know why so many of the Olympians are winners? It's because they expected to win. <laughs> you don't stumble your way into a gold medal. You practice over and over and over and over and over and over and over until it becomes muscle memory, until you don't have to think about it. And even then, when you're performing, when you're doing your sport, you got to overcome your nerves. You got to overcome the tension of the moment. But you've been practicing over and over and over, hours and hours a day for years and years and years and years and years. Okay? And you know why you do that? Because you expect to win. Anybody ever stumbled their way into a gold medal? You practice until you got those skills up to where they needed to be, or else you wouldn't be an Olympian. Well, what I'm trying to say there is that so many of us are so used to not being on the podium with God that maybe God is trying to give you something that's so many levels higher than what you're used to, but because you don't think that way, you can't adjust your faith and your thoughts to receive it. Maybe you've been asking God for a relationship, but the relationship God has for you is so much better than anything you've ever had before until you can't really imagine it. Maybe you've been asking God for a house, but the house the Lord really wants you to live in 
is so much better than any house you've ever lived in your entire life until you don't even think about moving into that neighborhood. It doesn't even cross your mind because you're so used to a certain level and maybe God's answering you on a higher level. Okay. The Holy Ghost told me to say specifically uh, everything I'm saying, but also that many of us are too used to cheap stuff. What if God is trying to give you the best products in the land and you keep looking for your blessing at a lower place? What if on a scale of one to 10, God is trying to give you some eight, nine and 10 level products and you keep looking in a one, two and three level pile? So you go to the store and you go to the bin and then you look, keep looking for the one, two, threes, one, two, threes. And Lord, you're going to bless me. Lord, you said you're going to bless me. And you keep looking in the one, two, three pile. And the Lord is way over there in the expensive corner in the eight, nine, ten pile. And it don't even occur to you to go over there. See, too used to cheap stuff. All right. Next point, because we got to keep it moving. All right. I want you to notice. I want you to notice. I want you to notice that Jacob told them to take double the silver. So when Joseph snuck that silver in their bags, he was doing that on purpose because he was testing their character. He was testing to see if his brothers were still in the same place. They still thought the same way. They still had the same kind of character that would make you sell your own flesh and blood into slavery. So he snuck that silver in the bag on purpose just to see what they do. Jacob, their father, told them take double the silver because he said you have to pay it back. Not only do you have to give that man, that man he was talking about was the son Joseph, but he didn't know it yet. Not only do you have to give that man back the silver that was found in your bag, but take a whole nother portion and give him that too. So if you had five bars of silver in your bag and, and, and Joseph told you, you stole that silver. And you're like, no, we didn't. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. Jacob said, don't just bring him five, bring him 10. He said, you got to keep, got to pay back what was found in your bag, but then we're going to double that. Okay. Double the silver equals character correction. Jacob said, you have to pay it back. There was a time when Jacob and his sons might have been like, hey, <laughs> more for us. <laughs> you know, his loss is our game. <laughs> it's our silver now. There was a time where they would have had that attitude. But can you see they've changed? Can you see Jacob was like, no, we can't. No, we can't do that. We got to give him back his silver. Plus, we're going to give him back a double portion. That represents character correction. So in other words, point number two is stuff going to catch up. When the stuff catches up, are you going to do things the same way you did them the first time? Are you going to do things the same way you did them the first time? Are you going to do things the same way you did them the first time? If you messed up and then you did like David and Bathsheba and tried to act like you didn't do anything wrong, well, you did like Joseph's brothers and like, la, 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 an animal killed him. You told that big old lie. Then you sat on that lie for over 20 years. You sat on that lie for over 20 years. When it catch up, when you get another chance, when life puts you in another situation to test your character, how are you going to behave? How are you going to respond? Are you going to do that time, the second time, what you did the first time? Or are you going to say, no, I can't keep this silver? And as a matter of fact, I'm not just going to return the silver. I'm going to return double the silver. I'm going to give you twice as much as, as was found in our bags. Is that what you're going to do? Because double the silver here represents character correction. All right. So let's review. I told you the story of Joseph and his family. Don't have to say that again. If you come on the broadcast late, Go back to the top and watch it from the top. Uh, first principle was that you might not recognize somebody you haven't spoken to in over 20 years. How do you know they're in the same place that they were last time you saw them? Uh, next one, your stuff is going to catch up. If you confess and repent, it gets wiped off of you and then you live a different way. If you don't ever confess that sin and you've been carrying that stuff with you, that's going to catch up. At some point when you have undealt with sin, okay? Next point, 
if enough if enough pressure gets on you, you will change. A lot of people are not hungry enough. They're not in pain enough. But if enough pressure gets on you, you will change. And God might let that pressure just sit right there. Seven years of famine, seven years of just no food, nowhere. You'll change. Uh, next principle, use the best products of the land. Whether you've done wrong or you've been wrong, give of your best. Because good quality anything has a way of smoothing over problems. Next principle, stop thinking so small. If you're used to cheap stuff, you keep looking for God's blessing to come down cheap street. Maybe God is on Park Place from Monopoly. Maybe God is on Boardwalk. Maybe God is on the most expensive property available. And you over there on Kentucky Drive and you over there on, on you know, Baltic and all them cheap places. And that ain't where the Lord is. He's on the most expensive street. You just don't know how to think that way because you're so used to thinking about cheap stuff. And then finally, are you going to correct your character? Are you going to give double the silver? Are you going to say, not only am I not going to keep this stuff that is not mine, but I'm going to give you double for your trouble? Are you going to do it differently this time? Are you going to do it differently this time? Maybe the last time you saw your mama, you cussed her out. Maybe when you see your mother this time, maybe you won't cuss your mother. Maybe you'll bless your mother. But you say, well, what if she's cussing me? Maybe you've grown so much in Christ until you realize you don't have to cuss her back. That even in the midst of her cussing you, you can show kindness because you can. You can show love to those that are just mean as junkyard dogs to you. Yes, you can. You can't do it in your own strength. You have to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord has to give you grace. It's really the Christ in you. The Lord has to love them through you. So you have to die to what you want to do so the Lord can come through. So God has to enable you to do it. But yes, you can show kindness to people where the last time you saw them over 20 years ago, they cuss you out and you cuss them out. Yes, you can. You can correct your character. You can give double the silver. You can give and receive the best products of the land. All right. Uh, I don't know who that was for, but I'm going to say what the Holy Ghost tells me to say. Okay. Here comes a, a rainbow word. Here comes a fresh prophetic word. For behold, my people, I want to settle old accounts. I don't want you walking around under a cloud of guilt and shame. And I don't want others walking around under anger and rebellion. So I'm releasing an anointing right now to soften and change hearts. Receive it for yourself and speak it over your loved one. And as I release this anointing unto you right now to soften and change hearts, then reconciliation and restoration can begin to happen. And we can close those old accounts and we no longer have to carry anything from the past anymore. We can get our slate wiped clean and you can repent and you can live the way I want you to live with no more burden from the past, says the spirit of the living God. Wow, I received that. An anointing released for softened hearts. Okay, so what that means is that you receive that for yourself. Receive that for yourself. Receive that for yourself, that if you've been mad all this time, the Lord just released an anointing where you don't have to be mad no more. Where your heart can be softened. Where you don't have to continue to carry all that anger and all that, that venom against what happened. And now speak it. Speak it over the person you have beef with because God has released the anointing. And the, the Spirit of God, see, when the Lord releases a word, when father and son release a word, the spirit of God moves upon it to make that word come to pass. 
And if the Holy Ghost said or an anointing relief is released, then the Holy Ghost has released that anointing and it's going to come to pass. So that means you speak it over that person. Speak a soft heart anointing to that person and watch God begin to move because his word will never, ever come back to him void. Hmm. Amen and amen. All right. That's it for today's live prophetic word. I hope you watched my broadcast earlier at noon with my interview with prophetess Kathy Summers. She had a lot to say about what the Lord had been showing her about worship and about the future. That's on uh, my Facebook page, and that is also on my YouTube channel. So go watch that if you missed that when that released live. That released live at noon today. And remember, I told you my goal for 2021 is to increase my reach. And so I'm going to ask you to do one thing at the end of every video. And what I want you to do with this video is share it. Share it with as many people as you know, because there are too many people, Christians and unbelievers alike. There are too many people that have been carrying, that have been carrying all this guilt, shame, anger, and fear over stuff that happened 20 years ago. And God is ready and has released his anointing all to help us forgive ourselves, forgive that other person, and get past it. So this video needs to be shared as many places as you can so that anointing oil can be released and we can finally close old accounts. Amen, amen. God bless. Thank you so much to those of you that watch me on Facebook. Thank you so much to those of you that watch me on Instagram. Thank you for those of you that are watching on YouTube. This video is gonna premiere in about 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you so much. God bless. And I'm just happy to be a part of God's kingdom. I'm happy to be a part of his program. I'm just happy to be used of him to flow in the prophetic word. All right. I will see you next Sunday. Next Sunday, August 8th. Same time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. Amen and God bless. And remember that it is time to both give and receive the best products of the land.